Hello everyone. Do you hear? <laughs> I hope our voice is okay. Uh, please let me know who are here. Anton is here also. Hello everyone. Um, I'm really glad to welcome you to our research and educational project. It is hosted by our laboratory, which is uh, called Shukhov Lab at HSE University. I hope you know about it. Um, you could ask your questions at any time and we'll answer them as soon as we can. Uh, please follow the links I've shared in the beginning about our project and the list of events on Facebook. Yeah. Um, our speech today is like an introduction to the whole project. We won't get too much into details because we're hoping that um, we'll, we'll get dedicated parts for more uh, particular topics. Uh, we'll split our speech in two today. First, Anna will cover the term urban modularity and explain what's that. And then I'll be talking about ceramic 3D printing as an implementation of urban modularity in our project. Uh, Anna, please start. Okay. Yeah, here just a slide about uh, what was the block of our research project. So we started from introduction part, what I hear. Uh, then we cover the topic on biomaterials and biostructures because it's also a key in terms of uh, urban modularity. Then we cover the future of this technology. So the, what is the relevance um, of this technology in the future? Um, maybe we should uh, change this to another one. And the final research project practice uh, is our summer school. Maybe after the quarantine, we are hope <laughs> in this regard. Uh, so, I, uh, I will give you uh, a short review uh, what um, the term of Uber modularity. Uh, you can also write in the chat uh, what do you think about this. Uh, so, uh, I will give you an explanation why we need to rethink this uh, phenomenon today, uh, what is the relevance, uh, why we need to rethink this. So, um, so we know that we have a lot of typical structures uh, like facade blocks, bricks, paving slabs, typical windows, doors uh, in the city. We also have urban furniture that is the same in different regions of Moscow in Russia as a whole. We also have typical lanterns and uh, simple modules like toilets or kiosks. Uh, so this is also modules that we can review, that we can change and why. So what is the problem? Actually, this is not so problem, it is like a fact, uh, because uh, all of uh, these modules has only one function. So there are no any response to the challenges, to social challenges, to social needs, uh, ecological challenges that are very um, relevance today. So uh, our challenge is to rethink this phenomena is to find new morphologies, uh, new materials. So um, we should propose uh, like new hybrid uh, technologies, new hybrid models that are able to respond to social uh, needs to like different uh, ecological challenges. So this is the key because uh, there, are, there is a huge potential of this urban matter. So this is like a border between outside, uh, between the interior and the exterior. This, this is really important for us. Um, and I, I will give you, uh, I will explain two cases. Uh, the first one is uh, ceramic structures as an engineering system. So the first case is based on 
uh, which of the module modules um, could have a function as like engineering system, ventilation one, or um, what are the structures are able to produce water because uh, this is very complex uh, system. This is not only the module, this is really a system. And um, I will explain the case so that based on mixed materials. This is, uh, the key here is just to explain uh, what are the um, ecological um, pastas, uh, the, what is the ecological pastas, and what are the components uh, that are able to provide uh, new green facades, uh, new green keramic structures, so what is the bio, bio keramics. So this is actually important because this is highly connected with architectural facades, so this, uh, this climate uh, outside and inside. So this is the key. And the white keramics itself. Uh, this is the key of our summer school, this is the key of our lecture. Why? Uh, because the clay or keramics has um, different features, actually really different. Uh, first of all, this is nature like a material. Uh, secondly, this is a um, wood binder based on natural components. Uh, but the other hand, uh, being glazing, uh, this is uh, this uh, material is able to absorb water or condense water. This is very crazy, <laughs> I guess. And uh, this is also a natural basis for other components um, as well, for greenery, for different uh, biosystems in the city. So we can provide different structures uh, based on only one material. And uh, we can start so, uh, we can start, yes, from engineering system uh, because yeah, current is the best in this way. So this project uh, from emergent objects, uh, the key here is just that these new type of modules as well, <laughs> uh, they are able to uh, pass through them the air and uh, this keramic is able to absorb water. And the process is based that, uh, that this air passes through the system, this follows uh, like, like honey uh, mold system, and uh, this is the put inside of a chair. So we have like this process as natural ventilation system. Uh, and this, this is a um, huge potential for all the structures in our city because, um, as you can see, um, we should provide all the, the complex structures that is able to combine engineering and architecture. This is also important. And uh, the similar technology um, uh, was created from, uh, by architect from India. Uh, this is a really relevance for for India itself, for for Africa, for all the countries. Um, so this is really um, natural condition. Uh, this is also based on technology that air passes through these ceramic tubes, and uh, air is cold. So this is a low tech energy efficient solution for architectural facades, or also for um, urban modules for uh, urban furniture, so this can be in different settings. This is really a uh, cool installation because this is also like engineering system, but this is very efficient. Um, here I show you my project. Uh, this is also based on this topic and um, I focused on uh, process of impression and uh, evaporation and uh, condensing water on architectural surface. So the key here is just um, what we that we can to produce water or any architectural surface um, if we provide uh, differences in temperature of surface and temperature of air. So the key here also is humidity. So this is the physical process that can be um, connected with architecture, this architecture shape, this architectural material, this is really a complex system and this is uh, um, can, this can respond to uh, different ecological challenges and can 
uh, be like their source of water in conditions of water depletion, for example, in those uh, uh, different countries today. Um, then I'm going to cover the second case uh, because we have already seen a lot of project based on morphologies, um, engineering systems, and so on. Uh, now we are covered the topic uh, how clay or ceramics can be mixed with other additives and what is the result. So this project also um, uh, yeah, based on clay. Uh, clay is mixed with cement, with um with salt blast, with uh, different additives uh, with wood component so yeah and uh, as a result we have like new type of green facade because this is the base for growing sequence or other plants and this is a simple way to produce green city as a whole um yeah and the key here is also clay so it is very simple to produce uh, this kind of facade but not the simple um rectangle block <laughs> uh, how we have today uh the second project is the same maybe technology but um as you can see this is a pavilion is completely based on this technology integrated with greenery so we have complex uh, system combining uh, clay, also concrete, uh, greenery, uh, yeah, greenery, salt, and um, as a result, we produce also a um, white green system. So this is also a very interesting thing to produce or print. Um, the next project, also a kind of biosystem inside of building so this is uh, the team here is uh, so we have like different modules uh, that uh, consist of clay and um, like uh, like bacteria this bacteria is able to change the color depending on um, air condition so depending on temperature and depending on uh, moisture so um, as a result uh, is um, is a responsive system to inside conditions uh, to interior one and responsive to people activity itself. So this is also a smart system based on clay and other um, uh, leaf components. So <laughs> this is also uh, very interesting to implement inside of the building and to implement maybe outside because if we have um this kind of system you know this is great i think in the city is not typical one and uh, i also um, uh, show you another topic not another topic and it's also uh, connected with structures but this is just new morphology so that we can provide uh, by 3d printing technology and uh, also based on ceramics so you see what is the difference between our rectangle blocks and uh, these prefabricated ones. So um, I think uh, there are no uh, reason to not to provide this. Um, and um, just shortly about reconstruction of the building. So you can see here the high, uh, high contrast between materials. If they have uh, like um, if we need to reconstruct some buildings, um, what was crashed because, um, during, for example, the war, uh, we can provide these uh, ceramic structures. And this is also a simple way to provide new aesthetic of the city and to uh, like produce new solution in this way. So this is also a point. And um, shortly about me, <laughs> why I'm in, uh, because um, I covered the topic, I covered the examples, um, not my personal one, because uh, this is not uh, my key focus. I, I focus uh, on biomaterials itself, because this is a key. <laughs> and um, um, 
my research by materials and by structures that are able to uh, be uh, like infrastructure as a city. So architecture then as an infrastructure is my uh, base of my research and my practice. So here to my key project, uh, Hydrometer that you have already seen and Michael Karst is also uh, uh, biomaterial based on natural components, but this is uh, smart because this is able to self-heal in ex extreme conditions. So this is highly connected with our topic of uh, new features of ceramics and so on. And also my key focus on rational water management by architecture is also highly connected with uh, water evaporation from ceramics and for example, pulling the building. Um, but here you can see different aspects of water management uh, by smart infrastructure or by new type of facades, maybe based on ceramics itself, because the structure is a key here. Um, yeah, and uh, all the topics, all the aspects, all the ideas I describe in my website. Uh, I have some scientific articles on this topic, and also I explain these topics in two words in my social networks, uh, because it's very important to uh, explain how it works in real life, why it works, and what are the methods to provide this in practice. So yeah, you can follow me <laughs> or just write in the chat uh, what are your questions and so on because um, yeah, and thank you for your attention. Anton, I think um, you'll follow my presentation with focus on 3D printing itself uh, because I covered a bit, yeah, whole topic. Thank you. Uh, website. Yes, sure. Uh, yes, this is my website. Mm, maybe there are no address here. I can write it here. <laughs> uh, thank you, Anna, for an explanation of what we see as urban modularity. Uh, I would like to ask our listeners and visitors what, what was the project you liked the most out of uh, uh, out of the ones Anna has mentioned. Uh, personally, my favorite is the giant air conditioner made from from ceramic tubes. What did you like about it? Because because maybe your answer. Uh, will uh, will lead us into focusing on something that fascinates people in these technologies more. So please give us some feedback. Okay, while while people have some time to think about it and answer, I'll start sharing my screen and my presentation. Hopefully, it will start working. So, I'll start with explaining who, who am I. I have some, um, well, first of all, I'm an HSC alumni, and I came back to our university now as a lead technology expert in Shulkov Lab. But while I was not in the university, I've been doing some digital design, and then I got fascinated about ceramics, and as I also was a maker and 3D printing and CNC enthusiast, I decided to combine both uh, things and started ceramic 3D printing. Um, luckily, I'm not the only one in the world. There is a whole community of people printing ceramics. 
Uh, on this slide on the left, you can see me uh, assembling the machine we will be using in our summer school and the one we're using uh, in our research project. And to the right, you see the biggest uh, object I ever printed so far. It's around 80 centimeters in height. Uh, if you ever had some experience in 3D printing plastics, uh, you would know that printing such a massive uh, sculpture out of plastics would, would take a week or something. Uh, in case with ceramics, uh, it took around three hours to print, which is uh, which which looks amazing to me. Uh, it has some downsides, the technology of ceramic 3D printing, but we'll we'll cover it a little bit later. So. We call our program Urban Modularity. Uh, Anna just explained uh, what is it. And I will be speaking about more technical side of, of implementation uh, of this concept. And here on this slide, you can see our 3D printer printing some of our objects we designed in the lab. Um, Um, could you please tell me if uh, anybody of you, of listeners, uh, have ever 3D printed or maybe 3D printed ceramics? I understand it's quite unlikely, but, but maybe you do have some experience. Could you, could you share it? Um, Christina is asking, how do you come up with the form of modules? I think that's the answer. That's question to Anna. And she'll have a chance to answer it right after my part of speech. So, ceramic 3D printing. Uh, the first question everyone's asking, how, how does it work? Like, um, and in this, to answer this question, we need to clarify which type of ceramic 3D printing we're talking about. Because there, um, several main approaches to, to printing ceramics. They're very, very different, but uh, I tried to, uh, to group them somehow. And actually, they group uh, pretty well by size. Uh, the smallest objects you could print and the most precise ones, uh, like uh, one-tenth of millimeter could could be achieved and even more precise is usually done by uh, ceramic powder sintered by laser. By laser. Uh, what it really means that uh, first it has some really professional and technical um, usage and most researchers would never use the outcome of, of this printing and also it's it's really expensive like machine that cinders uh, ceramic powder by laser could easily cost I don't know fifty thousand dollars or something like that uh, the next group is a printers that use ceramic powder jet binded by water or chemical binder uh, maybe you know about form labs uh, it's a technology uh, of um, special ultraviolet uh, curing resins that allow printing quite uh, precise objects. But again, uh, they're very limited to the size of the object. Uh, what we want to focus on in our research project is called an uh, well, it's a type of FDM or FFF ceramic 3D printing technology, which basically means that we're extruding ceramic paste. Uh, why we have chosen this approach? Because it gives the, the widest possibilities of, of the size of the object. Uh, it's relatively easy to master and uh, Well, it's, 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 it's the easiest one to work 
with in laboratory uh, situation. Also, uh, I would like to say that this technology is the nearest to the um, to the extrusion of concrete, uh, which means that if you master the extrusion of ceramic paste, eventually you could switch to concrete and start building, start printing buildings and and really large structures. So. Now I'll, I'll tell a little bit more about the technology of uh, extruded ceramic paste. Um, well, the technology was around, I think, from the late 80s, early 90s, but only with the beginning of the maker movement, um, it started to, to gain popularity. On the left, you can see the very first uh, open source uh, machine published. It's by the Belgian Belgian company called Unfold. They modified a standard plastic open source printer to start printing ceramics. As you can see, there is a little syringe, and there is a there is an air uh, line that's pushing clay, and it's possible to print. Then, um, when it really started, uh, English scientist and artist, Jonathan Kipp, uh, he has published an uh, open source 3D printer and tutorial on how to assemble and print, it, print, and, and, and print it. And I should say huge thank you to Mr. Kipp because that's how I started printing as well. Uh, so. What, are, what, what, how, how does this work? Uh, usually, ceramic 3D printers have three main parts. Uh, the, the, well, I'll call it the rig, which basically, the first one is the rig, the, the moving part. Uh, in, this, uh, in this slide, you can see an AnyCubic uh, 3D printer, which is a generic 3D printer. Uh, I, 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 I see some questions about not seeing me or, or, or lecture. Could you, could you please confirm that you see and hear me? Oh, okay, thank you. So yeah, in this slide we see a generic AnyCubic machine. Uh, it's a Delta 3D printer, but pretty much any CNC machine or 3D printer could be used. Uh, it's just a means uh, of, of, of moving uh, your print head around. The next, the next uh, piece is, an, a, is a print head. This is what dispenses the ceramic paste and uh, makes layers out of ceramics. The one on the right is made by by Anatoly Biroskin from Stoneflower 3D, and he is actually watching watching this uh, lecture at the moment. Hello, Anatoly. He also made an uh, open source extruder head. I really recommend googling and and and, and uh, yeah. So finally, the third part is the tank. It's on the right top. It's filled with a it, it, it is filled with clay diluted to consistency of uh, something like toothpaste and you can see it in the video on the left. So basically the clay is loaded in the tube, then it is fed with air or with the pressure of a mechanical movement like a ramp press in, in, into the into the extruder head, and then the machine starts moving to to control the flow of the of the paste. Uh, other than that, the process of three D printing is quite similar to plastic three D printing. We have some kind of three D model, like the one on the left. Then we slice it. We divide the model into layers and then we print it. We print it the way we sliced it in, into layers. Here on the right you can see 
a robotic arm uh, working as a rig for, for a 3D printer. Uh, unfortunately, we could not see the, the tank because it's it's really massive one. And this particular printer doesn't have a, an extruder head at all, so uh, clay is flowing as it is from, from the hose. So let's get more in, into detail of printing. Uh, the printing ceramics, well as well as printing plastics, re reminds me a lot of the traditional coil building. I think that's the technique uh, that was around for several thousand years before, even before pottery throwing was invented, when the potter was uh, laying some clay in coils and then building some levels of it and finally uh, smoothing everything to form a smooth structure. On the right you can see that with ceramic 3D printing very different uh, level of precision could be achieved. Uh, obviously the bigger layer is the faster you can print but also you lose some resolution. So now let's discuss why, why have we chosen ceramics as our material. Well, obviously it has some pros and cons. Uh, my favorite pros are is that it's cheap. Uh, like in some cases, uh, you could even use some clay which you could dig in your, I don't know, in your yard or in, in the nearby forest. Personally, I, I, I know two places around Moscow where I can dig some printable clay and I, and I did it which means that it's almost free. Uh, also, it means that it's natural material. Like with plastics, uh, you really, every time you print something, you contaminate the, the nature a little bit, unless you recycle your prints, which in plastics is quite, is quite complicated. Um, alternatively, in ceramics, if you fail a print, or you don't like it until you fire it, you could just throw it back into the bucket, mix it up and print again. Um, what I also like about ceramics is that it's aesthetically pleasing. I'll, I'll get into detail about this one. <clears throat> so humans we're using ceramics again for several thousand years and we get get used to it and if for example uh, I print a mug or a plate from plastics on a plastic plastic printer I, I, I wouldn't really use it for everyday use but with, with ceramics it's totally okay uh, to use your printed product which means that um, the result of a print could could be not only a prototype but a finished product. Again, uh, well, I covered that already. It's recyclable. Uh, also, clay is modifiable, which means that after you made a print, you can smooth it down, or you could uh, attach it to another print, or you could uh, make something from clay by hand and add to it. Or there is a huge, huge variety of possibilities. Also, ceramics is quite an interesting material um, but because of its properties. First, if it's fired, it's, tem it's quite temperature resistant, it's chemically resistant, it's electrically resistant, and uh, it's quite rigid. Uh, well, not rigid as, as metals, but in some situations it could, could be used instead of, instead of some other structure materials. So the cons of ceramics, obviously it needs to be fired. Like most of the pieces you have around in your house or you see, like bricks or, or some personal ceramic ware, uh, they have been fired in the kiln in the temperature like 1000 Celsius, which is, which is obviously a downside uh, because you have to fire something 
you print it before you could actually use it. In some situations, you could use it as it is, but we'll cover it a bit later. The next problem is that because we print in this creamy uh, toothpaste-like uh, material, uh, it doesn't really hold itself well. Um, so the only good way of uh, building, of, of printing something, is using self-supportive structures which can stand by themselves, by themselves, like. Um, for example, this little vase I printed, which is a modular object, it could only print this way. If we print it like, like that, uh, it will collapse under its own weight. So that's a tricky design question. Uh, and for now, we don't have any support material which can be used and detached later after the print. But uh, I, I hope in, in, in some years uh, we'll, we'll, it, will, it will change. Uh, also, because of the firing and drying stages ceramics go through, it's hard to make precise details. Like if you want to make a, I don't know, bolt and a nut, it's almost impossible to make in ceramics due to shrinkage and warping of the material which, which occurs in, in the firing and the drying stage. Whoops. That's, yeah. The main thing I like about ceramics and the ceramic 3D printing is that I find it beautiful. Uh, most people ask me how do you get rid of the lines um, after printing. Uh, my answer is 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 know how you just keep it and and you love it um, and here you can see some examples of, uh, of 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 the beautiful spaghetti formed by this technology and I think it's totally okay to keep them in the final product but if you really really want to get rid of them because it's a clay you could just take a brush or a sponge and smooth them down as you see on the very uh, right bottom image from, from WASP. They printed a huge uh, copy of uh, ancient Greek head and then they smoothed it down so they have more or less a uh, smooth object before firing. Um, so next thing. I will, I, will, I will just shortly go through some things that are interesting to me as an urban application of this technology. I, I, would, like, I would like, once again, point out that I was always more interested in the technical side of 3D printing and the design uh, for personal fabrication and uh, some commercial products for 3D printing, but since I've joined Shukhov Lab, my interest starting to shift to more urban applications. And uh, the things that uh, amuse me the most are the tiles, um, both from, uh, from design point of view and their, and their usage. Uh, Anna has just covered that. Like, for example, the tiles on the right are used uh, for plants to to grow on them and to stick to them better, so they're designed in a special way to form a green facade. Next thing are the bricks. Uh, that's, well, basically uh, ceramic 3D printing is the only way you could uh, make a huge variety of uh, some special bricks. Like if you want to do some historic uh, renovation, or for some, or you want to test specific purpose uh, of insulation or some other things, uh, ceramic 3D printing is, is, a, is a really good choice. Also, um, most, most, most commercial products in ceramics are made either by slip casting, which needs a mold for every piece you make, or by an extrusion which needs a huge machine and, and a die 
for each uh, for each form you make. But in ceramics 3D printing, in ceramic 3D printing, you don't need any mold or dye. You could just uh, print something really, really, I don't know, random, and you could get any object different from the previous one, which is impossible to achieve in any other technology. Um, to the right, there is an example from Alma Svensson. She is a speaker of our first block of lectures, and I will, I will get back to that a little later. Um, finally, what's interesting, uh, I mentioned that before, uh, history of humanity knows a lot of buildings that use clay and not cement for, for, for actually building uh, houses. Like, personally, I would rather live in a concrete home than, uh, than in the home made of a special clay mixture of clay and, I don't know, rice husk in, in this example, which is called adobe, just because Russian climate Russian climate is not really suitable for uh, living uh, in a adobe house, but in, um, in southern countries, like Spain, uh, you can see it in the top left picture, they have made this experimental pavilion, and According to, according to the makers, the company WASP, uh, they have reached a very high level of insulation, so it's, it's kind of a high-grade ec economical building. So now let's get back to our research project. What, ac what are we actually doing inside of this research project? Um, are you still seeing my slides? I guess it's stuck. Sorry, give me one moment. So yeah, the parametric constructions and the buildings from Adobe. I don't know if, you, if you've seen that slide, let's just take a look again at them for a moment. Uh, as you can see, if you want to print a ceramic uh, house, you need a really massive 3D printer and a lot of clay. Yeah. So let's get back to our research project. Uh, what actually we do in the lab at the moment? Well, not at the moment because we all stay home, but we did just before we got locked down. Uh, first, we decided to build a machine. Um, we, we decided not, well, uh, there is only one or maybe two commercially available machines of that size and they're quite expensive so we decided to build our own so we can modify it the moment we we want and like to to have full control of it that's the machine and it's already printing uh, the height of them of the print uh, area is 600 millimeters and diameter is around 500 millimeters which is uh, which is massive in terms of uh, plastic 3D printing, but average, I think, in, in ceramic 3D printing. And my goal is to print bigger, my personal goal. Uh, I hope I can print a house myself one day. Let's see if it, if it will happen. So after building this machine, uh, we decided to test different concepts. Uh, the very first uh, concept, we just discussed is a 
modular and parametric building. Uh, we, we chose this topic mostly to test the machine and get some first results because it's uh, it's pretty easy to design this kind of uh, stuff. Uh, this one is a is a model of a modular column on the right and on the left you can see some failures of, of the prints prior to successful printing. The second concept is a modular design of a pot, which can be used for urban indoor growing. Uh, as you can see from the image on the left, we can make some kind of rail system uh, in-house or maybe outside, which will hold special pots, which can be used to grow food in urban uh, situation. And also, we can modify their size uh, depending on the on the pot on, 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 on the plant that's sitting in. And also, we can add some special elements like uh, water reservoir and lightning system, which will all together be holding on the very same same rail system and uh, will follow the same design. So if we'll try, um, I don't know, to sleep cast it, we'll, we'll need at least, at least 20 or 30 molds for each design. But with 3D printing, we could just manually print each one of them custom, in, in custom design. Uh, the third concept, uh, which follows Anna's ideas a lot, it's a smart tiling. Uh, if, if you look at the picture on the right, you can see that it is a tile which has a, uh, a tube integrated in it. So we didn't add any tube, we just printed it in a way. Uh, it, 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 it already has the tube integrated. And on the left, you could see an example of a ceramic facade, which could be used, for example, for collecting uh, water uh, from, from, from rain and, 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 and storing it in, in some kind of reservoir, which also could be printed in this modular system. It uh, could be a roof tiling or facade system, and the possibilities are really, really wide. We could also plant some plants in there. We could store something. We could air condition and cool down or heat up our building. So uh, the idea is that we could test all, all, all of the possibilities that come to our mind. Um, finally, the fourth concept that we have uh, thought about is we, we call it advanced fabrication. Uh, again, because we, we don't need to produce any mold or s s make a standard project, what we could do, uh, we could uh, modify design of our object uh, depending on the material we have. For example, here you see a model, a scale model of a bench. The, the, the concept behind it is that, for example, we have a pile of sticks uh, or, or, or some wood uh, which is not suitable for making, for making uh, ordinary wood, woodworking pieces, like uh, they're all crooked or, or they're too thin and there is no way to process the material because if you start processing it, you will have to take more material away than you actually have left. So in this example, what we could do is, for example, we could scan all the sticks, uh, get the 3D, 3D model of them, uh, then we could match them somehow in the software and get the design which will design of the sidewall of the bench 
which will uh, make all these crooked and uh, wrong sticks match each other to form a flat surface which is suitable for, for using. Well, in this case, we, we didn't scan anything and didn't match. We, we, we matched the sticks to, to match the sidewalls, but that's the concept. And also, it could very highly probable could be made automatically. So, for example, you just have a bunch of material, you take a photo of it, the neural network or just some, some algorithm processes them and shows you the possible designs that you could get out of them. And then you just hit print and get the missing parts, which will connect everything together. And here you go, here you have the final product. So these are the four concepts we were, we were discussing in the lab and working on. I, I think we'll uh, give more updates on, on, on these. Also, I would uh, like to invite you and to uh, ask you to think about other applications of, uh, of this technology because we'll have summer school and we'll have the possibility to print your designs. So if you're curious about testing the, the, the technology or you have some idea you want to print out, please send it to us uh, and we'll, we'll discuss it with you. Um, also, I want to introduce some of our speakers, not all of them. I want to introduce three speakers who are, who are really connected to ceramic 3D printing uh, out of our lecture blocks. First is Alma Svensson. She will be speaking about role of designer and architect in digital fabrication. She's from uh, Denmark. She has built her own machine and she's exploring the topic of uh, modular ceramic constructions. Uh, really recommend her lecture. Next one is uh, Lydia Retoy. Uh, she's from uh, Hong Kong uh, Architecture University. Uh, she was, what they did in, in university, they printed the uh, imitation of coral reefs uh, in ceramics and actually put them in, in, in the seas, I, I guess, to check if the corals would start, start growing on them and what, like, I think Lydia will tell about it be better. But that's a really, really interesting implementation of technology and uh, an interesting case. Finally, I would like to introduce Joanna. Uh, she's from uh, Berlin Kunst uh, Academy or University. I'm, I'm like I'm not sure the name of the university. Uh, she has the cleanest ceramic prints I've ever seen. She She's like really, really on point in terms of fine-tuning the machine. She's making um, some uh, personal fabrication items and also she's preparing a huge master thesis on ceramic 3D printing so that could that would be obviously another interesting lecture. So what's next? Uh, I would also like to say that uh, we're not really limiting our experiments to ceramics. It's just the material which is easy to, to work with in the lab, but actually we're really curious about printing other paste materials like mushroom mycelium, like soil, like soil mixed uh, with some seeds and etc. And we'll be discussing, I hope we'll be discussing this in the next block of our lectures, the, the bio, bio materials and bioprinting. Also, uh, there are some other bio applications which are really, really similar to the ceramic 3D printing, like uh, this, uh, this uh, model of lungs and the prosthetic 
ear, they were all printed in some special paste material inside liquids, but with uh, with the technology which is really really close to ceramic 3D printing. So most likely in in the future, if you would like to go into this uh, topic. Uh, ceramic is a really good uh, start and, and a good practice to to do that. Uh, finally, we'll have another 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 block of uh, future of three D printing. Uh, three years ago, NASA has posted a competition. They they hosted a competition about three D printing a space station on the Mars uh, because obviously you couldn't take any bricks or concrete with you on a spaceship you have to you have to print with the material you have there so you have to build with the material so printing is a um, logic option and uh, it is already happening on earth uh, there is a Russian American company Epis Core which is building quite huge buildings. Uh, the one on the right bottom, the picture is, is, is about it. So we'll have another block of, of, of lectures dedicated to this. Uh, and I think that's all. I hope to see you in summer. I hope we can make some offline events so you could try, so you could try the machine and print some designs of yours. Uh, this moment, I'll stop sharing my screen. And we have some five, 10 minutes to answer your questions. Uh, let's go through them. We have a good question on how to possible uh, to raise with, with in real life. Uh, what is the biggest problem? Why we don't have this opportunity from Angela? Yeah, what is the biggest, biggest challenge you think? <laughs> I think actually my mention in this regard that we have no connection between uh, like architects, creators, scientists, and urban authorities. So we have no connection. So we have uh, a lot of proposals, uh, experiments. We can identify uh, necess uh, necessity of these uh, modules in real life, but urban authorities um, are sure that this is maybe uh, very expensive, maybe this is not so relevant i don't know actually that the, that's the key that there are no uh, opportunity to prove our concepts so for me it's like this <laughs> maybe anton well, I, I i think we're just not 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 there yet like uh, we we need to make a proof we need to start huge manufacturing of it so it's really price competitive and then you'll see every every building covered with with a sustainable facade like I mean, I'm sure it will happen uh, I'm not sure it's ceramic 3d printing technology that will be used but at least it could be used for testing this kind of uh, facade so uh, it's a, a little bit of everything limitation of technology limitation of time because People haven't haven't been thinking about it for for too long. I, I I'm I'm sure we'll get there in I don't know 10, 20 years time. So the next question is about rec rapid liquid printing of concrete mortar. Uh, well, it's 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 not a question but a proposition from Anatoly. Yeah, that's true, but the problem with uh, rapid liquid printing of concrete is that if you fail a print you could not really use the concrete and you and you have a bunch of uh, pure concrete laying around so uh, that's why I, I don't really want to experiment with concrete at this point I want to first master the, the ceramic process Um, 
Yeah, another another common dentures are also made of ceramics uh, from a dental technic technician. Uh, most likely, you're using uh, SLA printer like Formlabs for that, um, where where the resin is mixed to, with ceramics. We're not really focusing on this technology. I know I know it's doing well in in, in the dental. In the, well, basically, uh, that's the answer to the question about sustainable facade. So in, in dentistry, uh, this technology uh, really solves a lot of problems. So it implemented and got uh, ordinary pretty soon. And in facades, it's not there yet. So we're getting there. Uh, software package. I think we'll have a, a separate a separate one or two lectures about it. Um, so there is different software types used in in uh, in three D printing. First, you need to make a model, and pretty much any modeling software could be used. I personally use mo mostly Rhino for modeling. Uh, but it could be photos, scans from from real object, anything. The next, uh, the next is slicing slicing software. Uh, Cura could be used. I personally use Simplify 3D and Slicer mostly uh, because I'm a Mac user and I'm actually not sure if Cura is even available on 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 Mac. Uh, to start, it's it's a good it's a good way of slicing objects. But if you need to get into more advanced things, you you have to use Grasshopper, most likely Grasshopper or any other software which allows you to make a G code from scratch. So you have a total control over it. And yeah, we will for sure have a lecture about using Rhino with Grasshopper to generate to generate G-codes uh, for controlling robotic arms or 3D printing ceramics. Yeah, so we'll start with something like Cura and then, yeah. And finally, we have software to control the, the, the robot, uh, which is usually Repeter Host. There is a, there is a Pronter face program, which we also use, and if we use some robotic arms, they usually have some proprietary software which controls it, which we'll will master somehow. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you have some other que questions? Now, yeah, there is a person who is not happy about any cubic. Uh, Printer. I wonder which one, but generally I'm not satisfied with the regular FDM uh, plastic 3D printing at all. Uh, the 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 fail rate is really really high, despite the fact I have tried very 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 many <laughs> of the of the of the printers. So I, I I almost gave up the FDM plastic 3D printing technology. Yeah, we, we've covered some project layout. Yeah, we have three blocks of uh, lectures, which the first one is starting today. Uh, the next two would be, we will update about them, and then we'll have summer school. We planned it to have in July, but unfortunately we will have to postpone them to at least August or beginning of September. But uh, for sure we will have this, uh, summer school workshop. So uh, I would really um, like to ask you to go to this, uh, the very first link I shared in the chat. And if you're interested in this project, please register so we can have a means of contacting you about the date when we finally, when we finally plan it and schedule it. Um, I think we're out of time, and basically I've said everything uh, I wanted. 
Anna, do you have something to add? Just thanks, <laughs> and we prepared this short like um, answers um, for you because this is like selection of participants for summer school, and this is also based on your knowledges in ceramic 3D printing, in biomaterials, in 3D printing um, as a whole. So we prepared short like uh, questions for you. Uh, yes, and we are we are happy if you. Um, um, you'll be with uh, us. <laughs> one, one last thing I wanted to add uh, is that our 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 summer school is intended uh, not only for those who are good in 3D printing or 3D modeling, but also for ecologists or yeah. for I don't know, scientists who doesn't who don't have uh, this kind of experience because that's the main point of the summer school. We want to make teams of people yeah. who are good at printing and good at uh, thinking, I don't know, <laughs> and mix them all together. Yeah, sure. So don't, don't get scared away by the technology will we'll, we'll get you printing. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Thank you. OK. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Uh, Bye-bye. Thank you so much.